When I teach the 21st century in modern history, I often put up a map on the screen and get students to colour each country into two different spheres of influence. For instance, my country, Australia, is very clearly under the US sphere of influence, whereas most of Africa is increasingly under the Chinese sphere of influence. And when I get them to colour Vietnam, it's almost always the same colour as China. After all, both are Asian governments that are run by a communist party, and in the same way that China rivals the US for influence today, Vietnam actually went to war with them and fought them off in the 60s and the 70s. So after all, it makes sense for the two to be on the same side. Yet this isn't the case. And so today we'll be helping you find out why this is the case by filling you in on a war that you've probably never been taught about. The Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979. Okay, so according to pure ideology, China and Vietnam absolutely should have been on the same side of any major war in the last half century. But as I often say on this channel, there's far more to geopolitics than just what countries say they believe in. And so these are the four major contextual factors that created the conditions for war. There was the Sino-Soviet split, the Vietnam War, the occupation of Cambodia, and then Deng Xiaoping's ousting of Mao's official successor, Hua Guafeng. By the way, my subscriber question for you today is this. The official result of this war was a stalemate, but based on today's video, who do you think came off best in the war? Vietnam or China? Now, if you're a long-term subscriber, you would have heard me go on about the Sino-Soviet split countless times, but it was really important in restructuring the global order of the 20th century. Stalin and Mao had aligned themselves relatively closely with each other, but when Stalin died, Khrushchev began the process of de-Stalinization, and he called out his predecessor for the use of terror and for making a cult of personality around himself. For Mao, this was pretty pointed and was as true for him as it was for Stalin. From here, the Sino-Soviet alliance started to fracture and it was made worse when Mao began his Great Leap Forward, an attempt to out-industrialize the Soviets and become the global leaders of communism. From 1956 to 1966, Mao stationed 1.5 million soldiers along the border and the two Central Asian communist powers were now truly divorced. And so this then leads to our second contextual factor, the Vietnam War. Now, we're obviously not going to cover the whole thing, so let's just go for the Black Ops Cliff Notes. If you've played the greatest COD campaign of all, you'd know that the Soviets supported the North with machinery and some soldiers, while the Americans supported the South with soldiers and machinery. What you might be less familiar with is that China was involved in the early stages of the war, and indeed, Mao's PLA helped the North to defend Hanoi. But here was the problem. The tension between China and the Soviets was escalating, and so China withdrew its support to focus on defense against the Soviets. With America badly failing in Vietnam and the Chinese now enemies of the Soviets, President Nixon met with Mao to begin normalizing relations in 1972. When America left Vietnam in 1973 and when the South fell in 1975, the lines of influence were redrawn. Rather than the communists against the capitalists, it was a tentative China and America against the Soviets in Vietnam. But for the two to go to war, more needed to happen and so that's where Cambodia comes into things. Now, Vietnamese communists in Cambodia and Khmer Rouge had previously cooperated, but this changed when Pol Pot came to power. Essentially, he was paranoid about Cambodia being controlled by Vietnam and imprisoned Khmer Rouge soldiers who were too sympathetic to Vietnam and prevented Vietnam from having bases in Cambodia. Now, Mao had close ties with Pol Pot and China continued to be friendly to him after Mao's death, but Cambodia was invaded by Vietnam in 1978, and in January of 1979, Pol Pot fled Phnom Penh, that was a mouthful, to evacuate westwards. And so given that China had supported Pol Pot, and as the US had aligned themselves away from Hanoi, things were really tense. From China's perspective, Vietnam's occupation of Cambodia threatened their interests on the Indochina Peninsula. And so lastly, the final contributing factor to this war was the rise of Deng Xiaoping. When Mao died, he'd assigned Hua Guafeng to be his successor, see videos here, However, the support of the party was with Deng, and Deng effectively forced Hua to bring back all those party officials that Mao had exiled during the Cultural Revolution. Given that Hua was seen as of the lineage of Mao, this only helped Deng gain further party support, and when China experienced bad inflation by the end of the 1970s, Deng Xiaoping had become the one who was really in charge of China. Just after the Cambodian invasion, Deng went to visit Jimmy Carter in the States, and when he returned home in February, the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Mutual Assistance that was initially signed in 1950 had expired. With the treaty over and with China increasingly aligning itself with America rather than the Soviets, Deng announced that China would plan a limited invasion of Vietnam. 
So on February the 17th, 1979, 200,000 Chinese soldiers rolled into Vietnam from two fronts, Yunnan and Guangxi, which proved to be roughly a 1,300 kilometer border. Now, if you're new to the channel, I'm much better with political history than I am with military history. As soon as historians start talking about Spitfire, Nimbus, 2000, Kaidi, Mundi jets, I'm out. So we're going to keep it pretty broad here and I'll try to avoid using jargon as best as possible. Essentially, the Chinese aim with this limited invasion was to force Vietnam to withdraw from Cambodia to defend the homeland, and so a provincial capital, Cao Bang, was captured less than two weeks after the invasion began. China was then hoping to lure Vietnamese forces to defend this city, Lang Son. However, Vietnam had a strategy of keeping the fighting in rural areas, and so didn't take the bait, leaving China to take the city relatively uncontested on March the 4th. Now, though Vietnam did withdraw 300,000 soldiers from Cambodia for defense, this wasn't enough to achieve China's aim for a complete withdrawal from the country. And so on March the 5th, China ordered their own withdrawal, and as they withdrew, they applied the scorched earth policy, destroying much infrastructure, property, and farmland. The withdrawal was completed on March the 16th, leaving North Vietnam devastated. Now, a question you might be asking here is, what about the Soviets? Where were they during all of this? Well, they wanted to support Vietnam, but actually couldn't. Soviet reinforcements would have had to have gone through either Chinese or US allied controlled territory to get there. For any intervention, their only option was to reopen a skirmish over contested borders with China, which they weren't exactly keen to do. So when it comes to the casualties from this conflict, the figures are quite contestable. China, Vietnam and the West all have different numbers. Now, if you're a long-term viewer, you know that I often push back against Western commentary on history, but given that we weren't directly involved in the war, I'll reluctantly go with our figures. China suffered 26,000 deaths to Vietnam's 30,000, but there were some pretty major impacts beyond the casualties. Firstly, Deng Xiaoping was looking to liberalize the Chinese economy and coax foreign nations into bringing capital to China through special economic zones with lower tax rates. Though the first of these, Shenzhen, was established in 1978, Many other provinces, like Guangzhou, had to delay the wait for their turn until after the war in August of 1979. Secondly, though the war failed in getting Vietnam out of Cambodia, it did garner much public support against the occupation, with few outside the Soviet bloc recognizing Vietnamese leadership. Vietnam then pursued even tighter control over Cambodia. For Vietnam, 20,000 of those who surrendered were expelled from the party, and border skirmishes with China continued after the war, including a significant skirmish in 1984, and then a naval battle over the contested Spratly Islands in 1988. Armed conflict only ended in 1989, when Vietnam agreed to fully withdraw from Cambodia. In 1991, the two officially normalized relations, and then after much negotiation, they signed a border pact in 1999. So, to answer my students, that's why the Chinese in Vietnam aren't the closest buddies in the world. Thanks for watching. Make sure to let me know below who you think were the winners in this conflict, China or Vietnam. Like the video for the algorithm and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single China video. Next week in Australian history, we're looking at the beginning of the Liberal Party as Alfred Deakin blows up the Protectionist Party. You don't want to miss it. We can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.